title of my talk is Opening the Travel Floodgates, and it's really about the complexities of caring for the ill returned traveler in 2022. Um, I think many of you may have noticed that all of your patients are suddenly traveling again. And what we're seeing is that now that the mask mandates are off and now that the return to the United States testing requirements have stopped, um, we're seeing an explosion in Americans who want to travel abroad. Um, similarly, those who, of those of you who work for institutions where um, people are posted in the field, people are returning to their postings abroad. The travel industry has now coined a new term called revenge travel. Um, politely speaking, revenge travel is effectively about making up for lost time and making up for the experiences that have been missed as a result of the COVID-19 lockdown. Although do, some people do view it as traveling for spite um, now that um, as, as a sort of revenge against COVID. Um, but um, with this also comes um, new complexities in terms of caring for ill returned travelers. And one of the inspirations for this talk um, is a travel tragedy that happened to us in the winter of 2020. Um, before I get into this case, I do want to make sure that people understand the context of this. And I have great empathy for all of the providers that were involved in this case. In particular, um, in the winter of 2020, we were uniquely focused on COVID. We were in the midst of lockdowns and our healthcare system was relatively overwhelmed. But this case really illustrates the need now in 2022 to remove our COVID-19 goggles. So this was a 59-year-old man with BPH, hyperlipidemia, and chronic neutropenia who presented to another MedStar site with the actually the initial complaint of syncope, dizziness, and weakness. He did not have any fevers, and he'd just done a home colon cleanse, so people had assumed this was perhaps a hypovolemia issue. And um, to complete the story, he also, uh, about a month prior, had tested positive for COVID-19 while asymptomatic um, when he was in Dubai, which is in the United Arab Emirates. And this was recorded in the chart as a detected transcribed lab that you can see here. Um, and in a separate section of the EMR, it was noted that this happened one month ago. But if you were to look at this suddenly, all it would look like would be that the patient had detected COVID on admission. Um, at the initial ER visit, vitals were completely stable. Um, I'll point out that he did not have any fevers and labs showed some mild signs of hypovolemia, but notably platelets of 61 that were not explained. Um, liver enzymes and lactate were normal. So understandably, the patient was admitted for further workup, um, mainly due to the concern um, regarding syncope. And um, on the first and second days of the hospitalization, he suddenly developed high fevers of 39.8, vomiting and diarrhea, and the physicians caring for him went down the two most natural pathways, which would have been to do a very complete workup for syncope, which included a D-dimer and a CTPE, um, and also testing for COVID-19, um, flu PCR, and blood cultures. On the third day of hospitalization, the vital signs actually appeared to stabilize. There was still a very low grade of normal temperature of 37.5, but um, he was afebrile for about 12 hours. And what we saw with the hemoglobin was a slight downtrending in the setting of fluid resuscitation. And the platelets that were 61 went down a little bit and then seemed to come back up. And so the providers discharged the patient on the third day um, with diarrhea, fever, and thrombocytopenia, suggestive of viral infection. Later that same day, the patient returned to the hospital, but this time was brought in by police um, after having had a mo motor vehicle accident and he was found wandering confused outside of his car. Um, the police naturally suspected substance use um, and on arrival to the emergency department where he was cared for by different people than originally assessed him, he was found to be alert and oriented, but was responding very slowly. They noted echolalia and he was um, not able to give a very good history about the events that had actually happened. So again, understandably, the physicians um, taking care of him, went, this now went down the trauma pathway. This was someone with a potential head injury and low platelets. So they did a workup for CNS bleed. Talk screen was negative. So they thought perhaps uh, there was a concussion or a seizure. Um, but then he continued to have uh, fevers in the hospital along with elevated liver enzymes, elevated bilirubin and a lactate of 3.4. The CT scan had shown some very minor abnormalities in the gallbladder. And so again, they naturally went down the pathway of, okay, perhaps this is sepsis, started Piperacil and Tazobactam, got blood cultures, and then ultimately found the gallbladder was normal. And then when he failed to respond to antibiotics, then the, um, the possibility of a long COVID type syndrome was entertained. And um, because of the positive transcribed lab on the previous admission, on the readmission, it was again transcribed as a positive lab. And some of the providers looking at this test 
um, were understandably had the impression that it happened during the hospital stay. So the thought was perhaps the patient has COVID encephalopathy or, or maybe a CNS thrombus related to COVID-19. On the fifth day of hospitalization, the patient had an abrupt mental status deterioration. He was found with his eyes open, um, nonverbal, grimacing to pain, still having fevers. Um, and then at this point, um, providers started entertaining the possibility of meningitis, viral encephalitis, um, seizures and stroke. So he was started on IV acyclovir, um, IV antibiotics and transferred to Georgetown actually for the primary reason that the, and a lumbar puncture was not available at this site on the weekend. Um, now, some of you may have already figured out um, what this actually is. And um, when he was transferred to Georgetown that evening, a family member called the internal medicine team and notified them that the patient had traveled to Nigeria in addition to going to Dubai. The resident on call for internal medicine happened to be the global health chief who very quickly um, reframed this case as a fever in return traveler. Nigeria is, the top source, is one of the top source countries for malaria. Um, and this patient actually had severe um, P. falciparum malaria with cerebral malaria. So we did a rapid diagnostic test and a parasitemia. This patient um, on admission had a parasitemia of 6%, which is quite high, and that went all the way up to 15%, um, consistent with severe malaria. Um, the, now, this exposes another systems-related issue um, in terms of malaria in the United States. The infectious disease team gave the patient artemether lumefantrine, which is an oral medication via NG tube, because this at the time was the only medicine available to treat severe malaria on site. At that point in time, the first line treatment for severe malaria, which is intravenous artesanate, could only be obtained via the Center for Disease Control um, from one of 18 depots across the country. Fortunately for us, one of those um, is close to Dallas Airport, and the intravenous artesanate arrived on the same day. But as a result of that, there was still a lag time in treatment from the time of diagnosis of eight hours. So the, actually I'll go back. Um, as you can see, the patient's parasitemia declined um, quite appropriately, but the reason that plasmodium falciparum is so dangerous is that the malaria parasites actually sequester in the microvasculature and then result in a cascade of capillary leak syndrome um, and organ failure, um, which then in this, the case of this particular patient, um, despite the falling parasitemia, resulted in intubation, multiple transfusions, DIC, shock, um, AKI, and then ultimately the patient passed away. So that, that case is, a, that is, a, is an absolute tragedy um, and we actually know that even in a good year pre-COVID-19 in North America, we are quite bad at diagnosing and treating malaria. Um, this is data um, looking at it many different years in North America, showing that the diagnosis was missed at first presentation by about two thirds of providers. It took seeing up to three doctors to even entertain ordering smears. Many patients got non-guideline based treatment. And for the reason that I just outlined, treatment was often delayed for more than six hours. Post COVID-19, this has become even more of a challenge and even more of a complicated situation. Um, this was a letter to the editor published in the Journal of Travel Medicine describing a small series of travelers in Israel with severe malaria um, that described what um, all of my tropical medicine colleagues in different countries are reporting globally, namely that people are presenting with much more severe malaria um, and, uh, and it is leading to more tragic outcomes universally because of the combination of systems-based factors like delays seeking care, um, both because um, travelers may not want to expose themselves to COVID by going to an emergency department or travelers thinking that they themselves may have COVID-19 and staying home and isolating. Um, the concept of COVID-19 tunnel vision, both on the part of patients and providers, um, or the fact that COVID-19 can be a co-diagnosis or in this case, a distractor, um, overwhelmed healthcare systems, um, trainees that don't have experience yet with malaria because we haven't been seeing travelers. Um, the, one of the things that occurred in this case is that there were no visitors or family at the bedside because at that point, visitors were, were um, extremely restricted. So for patients with altered mental status, there's no one there to give the history. And then this patient also spent a lot of his hospital stay in an isolation room um, for COVID-19 because of the issues about past testing. We are also seeing globally that there is major COVID-19 related um, malaria program disruption that is leading to interruptions in distribution of bed nets and other types of um, insecticide spraying and protective measures, which um, in the World Malaria Report of, of 2021, they've noted that there are 14 more, million more cases of malaria and um, almost 50,000 more malaria deaths. 
Um, and I think this quote is very telling. This year's World Malaria Report is really surveys the extent of the damage wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic to the global malaria response. So um, with all that in mind, um, the objectives of my talk today are to uh, just develop an approach this, to the systemically unwell return traveler, since we know that all of our patients are traveling again, and, and it's important to have a refresher. Um, and we'll talk about the, the approach of geography, exposures, and timing. We'll discuss some common tropical infections that cause systemic illness. Um, I will review a typical workup, including some of the pitfalls of our diagnostic tests, and then to really understand that travelers may present um, differently than endemic populations, um, as well as to highlight the difficulty of, of handling diseases like malaria um, during COVID-19. So an introduction, first off, framing a tropical differential. So this is my mandatory slide, the differential for Ill systemic illness in the, returned, uh, in, the, in the returned traveler or in a traveler returning from the tropics. I usually give a five second pause to allow the trainees to come up with a lot of different causes and then do this. So even though malaria is not the most common cause of fever, of specific fever in the return traveler, it's actually a non-specific viral illness. This is the one thing that we don't wanna miss for the reasons that I've just outlined. The way that we actually approach a differential is to divide the problem into tropical and non-tropical, remembering that we're internists. And even within tropical travel, there are infectious causes and non-infectious causes. From the infectious perspective, we are gonna focus on the approach of get a travel history. So the acronym is geography, exposures, and timing. And we also think though about non-infectious causes and that travelers can present with thrombosis. And we also know that patients that have autoimmune diseases are more likely to flare with tropical travel. Some of the non-tropical conditions that I've seen in my tropical medicine clinic um, are return travelers that actually have fever and sweats from thyrotoxicosis, um, someone with um, endocarditis um, that was totally unrelated to travel, and my personal favorite, a traveler who had gone to um, the middle of the forest in Central Africa, immediately above an Ebola zone, had been sprayed with blood by poachers, had wandered in the field, had tick bites, um, had wandered through fresh water and brackish water, and it turned out that he actually had acute CMV from his own child in daycare, um, nothing to do with the trip. So in terms of knowing what's geographically common, um, even though this is an older series, this is still my favorite paper um, to inform yourself about the subject. The GeoSentinel um, sites are a network of tropical medicine clinics globally that sort of serve as canary in the coal mine sentinels for um, outbreaks and also having a sense of what's common in ill return travelers. So this was a series um, looking at almost 50,000 ill return travelers who presented to tropical medicine clinics and they divide the illness into syndromes. So if you wanna know what the most common cause of fever, diarrhea, dermatologic issues coming back from a specific place, um, this is a good place to go. So if we look at different regions of the world, we see very different distributions of diseases that cause acute illness. Um, and this is looking at causes where the disease was identified as opposed to cases that were non from non-specific viral infections that resolved. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, overwhelmingly P. falciparum malaria is the most common diagnosis. Um, second being rickettsial uh, diseases from the spotted fever group, which I'll touch on later, um, some dengue, and then much less plasmodium vivax and enteric fever. This distribution changes completely when we move to Southeast Asia, where dengue is overwhelmingly predominant. We see a very um, pretty equal mix between P. falciparum and P. vivax. And then um, even though enteric fever is number five, this is the region where we see the most um, exported typhoid and leptospirosis is a consideration there as well. And again, looking at Latin America, dengue is um, overwhelmingly the most common diagnosis and we see a lot more P. vivax um, than we do P. falciparum. Then even within geographic zones, uh, the destination is not just about the country, it's about where you go within the country. So in a traveler that's gone to up here in the top graphic, which is a, a aerial view of Iquitos in the middle of the Amazon, this is a tropical region of Peru. Um, and what we see in terms of diseases are um, dengue, malaria, yellow fever, and it also happens to be the um, capital for um, sexually transmitted infections in South America. The lower photo is Machu Picchu. This is a high altitude destination where there are really not very many diseases um, that are sort of more classified as um, tropical mosquito-borne diseases. And what we tend to see there is brucella, fasciola, and altitude sickness. Um, this is actually my favorite part of the tropical medicine visit is taking the exposure history. So it's about what people did or what they didn't do. Um, the infectious disease division is famous for torturing medical students and residents by making them take extremely detailed um, exposure histories, but sometimes it pans out to interesting diagnoses. 
So these are a general list of things that I consider ranging from outdoor adventure activities. Um, sex is in bold and highlighted um, because we do see every year travelers that return from the tropics with acute HIV related to unprotected sex abroad. And then the other very important question is why did you go on your trip? Um, and the why um, partly relates to risk stratification. We know that um, patients who are traveling to visit friends and relatives are special and they have their own acronym within tropical medicine, the VFR traveler. Um, these types of travelers tend to go to more remote areas, stay for longer, stay in local homes, are less likely to see, seek pre-travel advice, and often do not perceive themselves to be at risk, which is perfectly understandable since it's viewed as returning to a place that I have lived for a long period of time in the past where I have never taken any of those precautions. But as a result, um, the bulk of US malaria cases come from VFR travelers. Um, the last element of the geography exposures is timing. Um, tropical illness, remember, has seasonal patterns. So if you travel to Sub-Saharan Africa in the winter, you are at risk of meningitis. Um, if you go to South Asia during rainy or monsoon season, that's when we see our cases of leptospirosis and dengue. Um, and if you go to South Asia in the summer, that's when Japanese encephalitis is more of a concern. And remembering that um, influenza in particular in equatorial parts of the tropic is a year round illness. And that in the Southern hemisphere, the seasons are reversed. So in our summer, that would be their influenza season. And the last part about timing is um, known outbreaks, but also seasonal patterns of mosquito-borne illness. Um, this is uh, during post-Olympics, Paralympics, and World Cup, we were obsessed with publishing, publishing papers about return travelers from Brazil. But this one really nicely illustrates how during um, the uh, Brazilian summer season, uh, January through May, this is when we're really seeing all of our mosquito-borne diseases, which then take a major dip during their winter, which is the opposite of ours. And the last part about timing are recognizing incubation periods, which are really um, helpful in travel medicine and are your friend. So in particular, if you know that your traveler's symptoms started more than two weeks after returning to the United States, um, we know that the illness is not caused by dengue, chikungunya, rickettsia, or yellow fever. Those are short incubation period diseases. So it sometimes helps you rule things out. So with that being said, um, now that we've discussed a general approach, I will get to part one, which is um, talking about the intersection of malaria, COVID-19, and as a problem combination. A brief refresher in terms of malaria, uh, remember that it's caused by a protozoan parasite um, from the plasmodium species. It's transmitted by the bite of the Anopheles mosquito. These mosquitoes bite at night. And importantly for malaria, this will come up with the clinical symptoms. There is a life cycle where when from the time that the person is bitten by the Anopheles mosquito, it injects these premature forms called sporozoites, which first go to the liver. This phase is not symptomatic. So this is within the incubation period. Um, and the malaria parasite stays within the liver for a period of time, most commonly about 10 to 14 days, but it can be much longer than that. The malaria then, sorry, I'm getting finding my cursor. So when the, when the malaria emerges into its asexual blood phase, that is when travelers become symptomatic. So there is a delay from the bite of the mosquito to the person becoming clinically symptomatic. Malaria is found in more than 100 countries abroad. In some places like Sub-Saharan Africa, malaria is ubiquitous. And although the risk may be higher with rural travel, we also see it with um, urban destinations. Um, in many countries, though, in particular in South America and South Asia, malaria can be a very focal disease. So you'll see that this is Brazil. Um, most of the major cities on the coast do not have malaria, whereas if you go to the Amazon, it's truly endemic. This cartoon is in very poor taste, but I think um, hammers home the point that severe malaria can kill up to one out of every five people that gets it, and it is the number one infectious cause of death in travelers. With malaria, there are five different um, major human species that behave very differently. Um, P. falciparum and also a focally um, zoonotic malaria that is distributed in very specific parts of South Asia known as P. nolesi. Um, those two are, can both be extremely deadly, um, even relatively quickly um, in non-immune travelers. Um, P. vivax also has the potential to cause severe disease. And there are also um, other species, P. ovale and P. malaria that tend to be more indolent. P. vivax and P. ovale are both relapsing species. They have a secondary liver phase that's known as a hypnozoite that can stay within the liver and then emerge later, including months after the person has been originally infected. Um, 
Malaria in Africa is mainly, but not exclusively, Plasmodium falciparum. Um, this partly relates to the fact that P. vivax um, in, uh, mainly relies on the Duffy antigen to actually enter the red blood cells, and uh, many of the uh, endemic populations in this area are Duffy antigen negative, so it has trouble getting a foothold. And then we, if we look at the P. vivax distribution, it is the predominant species in Central and South America, um, as well as, um, as South Asia, but it's mixed with P. vivax and P. falciparum. Um, of note, um, Plasmodium vivax has the ability to present a lot later than P. falciparum. So in terms of return travelers, almost all travelers with Plasmodium falciparum, falciparum malaria, so 96%, will present with symptoms within 30 days of returning from their trip. Whereas for P. vivax, that number is actually only 60%. If we take that up to 90 days, we've now captured almost all cases of P. falciparum, but P. vivax only about 75% which means that up to about a quarter of P. vivax cases are actually presenting three months to even sometimes more than a year after traveler. So um, I'm showing this mainly to, um, to illustrate the importance of when you're taking your travel history, even though the first three months is most relevant for P. falciparum, we usually ask for travel outside the United States up to a year to make sure that we're not missing those P. vivax cases. Um, Pre-pandemic, imported malaria in the United States was steadily increasing um, on an annual basis, with the exception of a small dip in 2014 to 2016, which was during the Ebola outbreak. And um, presumably, the, our latest data is from 2017. Um, what, what we expect is that things will, again, again take a downturn in 2020, 2021, um, but now expected to rise again in 2022. And in a typical year, the United States sees just over 2,000 cases, mostly P. falciparum, and about almost 90% coming from Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's really the region to focus on. Um, in addition to different types of malaria, P. vivax and P. falciparum behaving differently, um, different hosts who get malaria also um, illustrate different types of symptom complexes and severity of illness. Um, so right now we're gonna introduce the concept of a non-immune host. A non-immune host is somebody who grew up in a non-endemic country like the United States in which if they acquire malaria, it can be deadly or result in severe disease even within days. Then we're going to contrast that with a host who is semi-immune. Um, these are patients who have many episodes of malaria as a child, and importantly, have ongoing residence in a malaria endemic area. And these types of patients as adults can present with low-grade parasitemias with very few symptoms. And in fact, when they show up to hospital with symptoms, they may have malaria and something else. It's important to recognize though that if a semi-immune patient moves to the United States, over time they will lose their semi-immunity and start to behave more like a non-immune host. So many of the patients that we see um, in the United States who are living in the DC area may have the false perception that they still have that semi-immunity which they have lost over time. All right, my malaria tip number one, which will come up later, is that malaria is really a diagnosis of the ill return traveler, not just the febrile return traveler. And so although the typical symptom complex are fever, headache, myalgias, malaise, there is a syndrome that can present that is mainly GI predominant with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, which can very easily be confused with acute gastroenteritis. And so even though almost all non-immune travelers are febrile, only about 75% of semi-immune travelers have fever. Um, we don't in this situation ignore subjective fever. Um, and in many of the malaria studies, when they're counting that greater than 95%, they're using as a threshold 37.5 um, as, a, as a definition. Um, the second part of this is that fevers in patients with malaria can be intermittent, and they can also be interrupted by, um, met, by medications that are antipyretic, so Tylenol and, um, and NSAIDs. Um, do not expect fevers in non-immune patients to be cyclical. So people learn in, from the medical school textbook that fevers may be every 48 hours or every 24 hours. Um, that is a feature of malaria in patients living in endemic areas where they can have malaria for more than seven to 10 days, um, which is about the amount of time that it takes the parasite to kind of start synchronizing its life cycle and result in that periodic fever. Um, but we don't see that in non-immune travelers because by day seven to 10, they're critically ill and may not survive. And then, right, we've mentioned that primary symptoms can be gastrointestinal. And then we also need to be really aware of the intersection between COVID-19 and malaria. Um, people are also reporting um, 
COVID-19 and malaria as a co-diagnosis, which makes sense if you think about someone travels, they get off an airplane, um, COVID-19 has a pretty short incubation period. So they may present with COVID symptoms early, even a couple of days after returning from the flight. Malaria as a, non, um, as a longer incubation period disease might come out a week or 10 days later, but at that point, the fevers may be mistakenly attributed to COVID. So you still have to bring the person back and test them for malaria if they've been to a malaria zone. Um, tip number two is that if you see a return traveler that has low platelets or leukopenia, but in particular low platelets, that's the most common CDC abnormality and is really a tip off. Um, many travelers don't initially have malemia, anemia, both because it's either early malaria in a non-immune host or the person may be hemoconcentrated because of um, volume depletion and the liver enzymes are often elevated. So these are the two tests that we use to diagnose um, malaria at point of care. So on the left, you see your thick and thin smears. Um, the thick film is to really diagnose malaria. So it's a much more concentrated volume of blood where it's easier to see parasites. The thin film is more about establishing the species based on the morphology. And that's what we use in the United States to calculate the percent parasitemia, which gives us the burden of infection. Um, on the right, um, this is a rapid diagnostic test. And I'm using the trade name, the Binax now, because this is the only FDA cleared test in the United States. Um, this test gives us a very fast answer. You read it in 15 minutes. And in the United States, it's more sensitive for P-falciparum um, than, uh, than the thick and thin smears. And importantly, for reasons I'm about to describe, in order to rule out, to truly rule out malaria, we need to do this at least three times and at least 12 to 24 hours apart. And I'll illustrate that with a case that came to Georgetown a couple of years back. This is a 47 year old man with sickle cell trait who was born in Cameroon and has lived in the United States for a long time. He presented to the ER with three days of fever and vomiting and said, it feels like I have malaria. His platelets were low, his hemoglobin was 11, and he'd just gotten back from Cameroon. So um, this is, as Dr. Copeland's joke, he was wearing his I have malaria t-shirt. Um, but we did his uh, thick and thin films as well as his Binax test in the emergency department, and both were shockingly normal. So we admitted him and repeated the thick and thin film, film eight hours later. Um, which found a 0.2% parasitemia, which is fairly low grade. Um, we asked one of the technicians who is an expert technician in reading malaria slides, who has worked a lot in an endemic area to reread the overnight film and a 0.1% parasitemia was actually missed. So the moral of the story is that both the smears and the rapid diagnostic test can miss early malaria with low parasitemias. And this is an issue um, in particular in non-endemic settings where the smears have a lower sensitivity because our technologists don't see that many malaria cases. So we know that they sometimes miss low level parasitemias, the species can be misidentified and the percent parasitemia um, may not be fully accurate. Um, before we discuss the Binax now, um, of course, everybody's a lot better at reading these lateral flow assays because of course, everybody's self-testing themselves with their um, COVID rapid antigen tests um, all the time at home. But um, I need to tell you a little bit more about this one before we talk about its um, benefits and disadvantages. So in the Binax now malaria test, you see the C at the top is the control line. The T1 is known as the PF or P-falciparum band. It measures the reaction to the HRP2 antigen that is only found in P-falciparum. The T2 band here is a panaldolase band, um, which may be positive in any of the malaria species, including P-falciparum. But if it's positive, it can be either that the person has P-falciparum along with the T1 band, or they may have co-infection. So this test is really useful for diagnosing P. falciparum quickly. Its sensitivity is over 95%, but um, of note, the sensitivity de may decline to 70 to 75% in patients who have very, very low parasitemias. Um, the second part of this is that this T2 band only has modest sensitivity for picking up Plasmodium vivax and very poor sensitivity for picking up any of the other malaria species. So as a consequence, this rapid diagnostic test, though very useful, can miss early P. falciparum malaria and can also miss other malaria species. And so now we'll introduce the concept of the pyrogenic density, which is the level of parasitemia where people develop fever. Um, in non-immune travelers, so this is your US born patient, um, they can become symptomatic with malaria at very, very low parasitemias. Um, and may present with fever with, with something that would not be detectable by either the malaria smear or the rapid diagnostic test.
So I'm putting up um, some MedConnect uh, here just because it's something that can be a significant issue for people. Um, most of the time, malaria is an emergency department and inpatient disease. Um, but there are times that you may be in an office setting where you have a lower suspicion for malaria, but it is on your differential and it's important to rule out. Um, you can at Georgetown Hospital get same day malaria smears and rapid diagnostic tests as an outpatient within a two hour turnaround time through the, um, through the inpatient lab. The way that you do this is you type in malaria, you see two options come up. And if you're ordering a malaria smear, the key here is that you have to change the collection priority to stat and the person must collect it downstairs at the Gorman lab. Um, if you change it to stat, you will get that two hour turnaround time. Um, if you leave it as routine, this smear will go to LabCorp and take three to four days to come back, which as we've just described is a very dangerous situation. And same thing, we can order a rapid diagnostic test in the lab. This one comes back very quickly. And um, this, we had this order built into MedConnect for a rapid malaria antigen detection. Um, and it will say MedStar only, but they will do this for you downstairs. But if you have a high suspicion for malaria, so let's say you have a traveler with a fever coming back from Sub-Saharan Africa, um, those are patients that most of the time need to be sent straight to the emergency department. Um, almost all non-immune travelers with PFAL cipher malaria need hospital admission. And this is even if they appear well, even if the parasitemia is low. And we've seen some instances where patients are seen at urgent care and are sent home um, with a a prescription for anti-malarials at the pharmacy in some cases, which they're not even able to fill. Um, and that's, that's something where patients will always end up in the emergency department with more severe disease. Um, there are some cases where we can consider treating semi-immune patients that have P-falciparum or patients that have non-falciparum malaria as an outpatient, but it's really a case-by-case -case basis um, thing. And I usually like to observe people for at least eight to 12 hours in the emergency department first to make sure that they're stable, they've tolerated their anti-malarials and that their parasitemia is stable. And then generally speaking, we repeat the parasitemias every 12 to 24 hours until we no longer see parasites. So I will end the malaria portion with a not as depressing malaria, uh, malaria tale for 2022. Um, and this is a 55 year old flight attendant who had a history of a Rouen Y gastric bypass and prediabetes. Um, and she actually had a history of very short trips to urban Ghana where she was staying in air conditioned hotels which would normally not be particularly high risk but she presented with six days of purely gastrointestinal symptoms. She had nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, watery, non-bloody diarrhea, no fevers, and she was continuing to work and fly around the world, passing all of her COVID-19 screens um, and having multiple negative COVID tests. She ultimately presented to MedStar Urgent Care on about the sixth day of illness. Again, um, illustrating the point, she, at the time of presentation, she did not have a fever, appeared dehydrated and she was sent to the emergency department with a diagnosis of probable acute gastroenteritis, but she needed IV fluids. She went, she presented to an outside emergency department. And again, we're going to see the same pattern, low platelets. In this case, she's got mild acute kidney injury. Um, her bilirubin was up, her lactate was four, and she's got hematuria. And in this particular case, she then in the ER, then developed a fever of 39 degrees, um, was tested on a rapid test for malaria. Um, this was a, this is her actual blood smear that we did at Georgetown, um, showing a 15% parasitemia of P. falciparum. And but before the malaria diagnosis and before the transfer, in the 12 hours that it took her from the urgent care to be sent to Georgetown, she developed rigors, high fevers, um, lethargy with confusion, somnolence, couldn't take oral medications, um, and actually required vasopressors. And so the point for the internists that are working as hospitalists is really the um, importance of recognizing severe versus uncomplicated malaria. Um, these are the criteria for severe malaria. And really it's looking at both the parasite density, but also the patient's end organ manifestations. Um, in semi-immune populations globally, um, the parasite density that is defined as severe is more than 10%. Um, in travelers, the CDC says 5%, but in actuality, you may see some of these severe end organ manifestations in travelers that even have a 2% parasitemia. And um, again, as illustrated by this case, patients can deteriorate quite quickly. So um, in April, 2019, intravenous artesanate was approved as the first line treatment for severe malaria in the United States. It results in really rapid, rapid parasite clearance. 
and it replaced the older drug um, quinidine, um, and which this was a good thing in that intravenous artesanate actually um, decreases mortality from 20 to 25 to 35 percent compared with intravenous quinidine. But the issue was that intravenous quinidine was locally available in the hospital, whereas artesanate was not FDA approved, so it had to be acquired from the CDC. In 2020. Um, a company was formed um, in order to um, allow the commercial distribution of artesanate in the United States, which was then um, FDA approved. And the, the idea was that it would give patients access to a life-saving drug immediately so that we wouldn't be waiting to get artesanate from, um, from a CDC depot across the country. And a company called Amavas um, was formed for the unique purpose of actually commercially being able to market this medication. Um, but, the, but the real issue is the cost. So intravenous artesanate costs about $5,000 per adult dose, which means that for the first 24 hours, that's about a $15,000 price tag. Um, and if purchasing the medication from this, co from this company at the point in time that a patient has malaria, the distribution time is somewhere between 12 hours to five days. So again, that's not gonna work. Um, unless it's on formulary. So I would specifically like to thank Lan Duong and Clara Nee, who are our two pharmacists who have both um, advocated to have this medication on formulary at, um, at Georgetown, and also were involved in developing the clinical practice guidelines for the hospital. Um, we now have intravenous artesanate on formulary at Georgetown. There is a limited supply that is always available in the pharmacy. The criteria is for severe malaria in patients that are not tolerating orals. And as a result of this, I think this probably saved um, this recent patient's life. Um, from the time that she was admitted to Georgetown, she got her intravenous artesanate within about 30 minutes, which is pretty astounding. So she did extremely well. She got the standard course of intravenous artesanate. When her parasitemia came down, she was switched to oral medications. Um, she decreased um, quite quickly and she was discharged after eight days of treatment. So the moral of the story about malaria is that we need to start asking all of our sick patients about travel. Um, Flu-like and gastrointestinal symptoms may be prominent, so don't get fooled. Um, when you do malaria testing, it needs to be stat and it needs to be repeated if the first one is negative. Um, outpatient treatment is really the exception. And now that, thank God, we have IV artesanate on formulary. So with that, I'm going to move into my next um, series of um, tropical infections um, and moving to things that are more common in Latin America and South Asia, in particular dengue. So this is part two, dengue and day-biting mosquitoes. Um, dengue, otherwise known as breakbone fever, is caused by a flabby virus and transmitted primarily by the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Um, malaria is more common in rural areas, whereas dengue is actually both uh, more so an urban disease. Um, there are four dengue serotypes and multiple serotypes can co-circulate in the same region at the same time. Um, what we are seeing right now based on the global diseases, uh, burden of diseases report is that dengue incidence, incidence is significantly increasing globally. We went from having um, about 30 years ago, about 30 million cases per year, now up to close to 60 million cases per year as of the 2019 data. Um, there are likely multiple reasons for this. Some of them are human factors related to urbanization and increased population density, as well as urban poverty. Um, this is a photo that illustrates that pretty nicely. This is from um, a dengue outbreak in Honduras. And what you see here are a lot of cases of um, small amounts of standing water, which are perfect breeding grounds um, for, uh, for Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Um, we are also seeing um, more global travel, which um, allows the possibility of introduction um, of dengue into previously non-endemic areas through human movement. And then the last part related to climate change that um, generally speaking, there is a predicted shift in the distribution of dengue and malaria. Um, malaria, um, malaria is more easily transmitted at intermediate hot temperatures, whereas as the temperature rises, dengue is actually transmitted more efficiently. So what, we're, what is expected to happen is that the hot spots of malaria may transition to areas of Eastern Africa that are at slightly higher altitude and are currently a bit cooler, whereas dengue is expected to ex expand its range um, throughout all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Although right now the major burden of disease, as I mentioned, is in South Asia and Latin America. So here's our case. This is a 35 year old man from the United States who uh, went for two weeks to a Mexican resort. He started feeling unwell on the plane on the way home, developed high fevers with headaches and myalgias. Um, and then at the point that we saw him in tropical medicine clinic, um, for the past 24 hours, his fever had just resolved. 
This new rash had just appeared and his hands and feet were now swollen. Um, and you can see this nice handprint that's formed that has um, resulted in, um, right, you can see this with the rash. So what do we do now? Um, so dengue, Zika, and chikungunya are, um, are all have very common features. Um, dengue and Zika are, of course, flaviviruses, and chikungunya is an alpha virus. All three of them result in a similar constellation of fever, headache, myalgias, um, and rash. The incubation period for all of them is short, typically three to five days. And the rule with dengue is the systemic illness comes on in one week and gone in one week. So this is not a cause of prolonged fever of unknown origin. Um, this, is some, this is an acute illness. Clinically speaking, it's very difficult to tell the difference between these three things at the time of acute presentation. Um, all of them can have fever, although in Zika, it may, it's more likely to be absent. Um, Zika really, really commonly presents with rash, and, um, but we still see it in dengue and chikungunya. Um, Zika has, um, is the one that is likely to result in conjunctivitis. Um, with arthralgias and arthritis, um, with dengue, it's more myalgias, and we tend to see the frank arthritis with chikungunya and sometimes Zika, and the headache for dengue is classically retroorbital. Um, the main point of distinguishing between the three viruses is understanding which complications are of potential concern. With dengue, we worry about um, severe dengue or dengue shock syndrome, which results of, um, a, as a result of third spacing, shock and bleeding. And important to note, um, for people that um, acquire dengue, if they are then reinfected with a different dengue serotype, they're at higher risk of developing severe dengue. Um, with Zika, we all know about congenital Zika syndrome. Um, there's the potential for sexual transmission and a rare risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And with chikungunya, the real issue is acute and then followed by, in some cases, debilitating chronic arthritis. Um, dengue, the course of illness is really a, it's a biphasic type illness where in the early febrile phase, what we see are often high fevers. Um, and uh, this is when patients are viremic. But the key period to focus on is actually this uh, one period known as the critical period, which happens um, uh, from about 24 to 48 hours after the person's fever goes away. So that's really the part to focus on. And this is when people may develop severe dengue. They have the drop in platelets and the rise in hematocrit related to third spacing. This is the classic dengue rash that we often see during the critical period. And you'll note these sort of islands of white sparing. Um, this is really classic, although not specifically pathognomonic for dengue. And the important thing with severe dengue is to watch out for the warning signs. So these are signs that somebody may be progressing towards a more severe trajectory that we see during the critical period, um, in particular, abdominal pain, vomiting, um, lethargy. Um, and this is also the time point that we see that rapid increase in hematocrit and decrease in platelet count. Um, severe dengue is caused by severe plasma leakage that results from a capillary leak syndrome and that can also develop hem hemorrhage um, and organ damage and shock. This used to be called dengue hemorrhagic fever, but we've changed the name in part to reflect that hemorrhage actually is not what happens in the, in the majority of patients. Um, it's rare to have travelers that have life-threatening dengue, but up to 20% of travelers will require hospital admission for supportive care. Um, and as I mentioned, severe dengue is more common if you've been previously infected with a different serotype. The key aspects of management for dengue is that they can be followed as an outpatient if you have someone who's reliable, young and healthy, and doesn't have warning signs, but um, this needs to be reassessed very frequently, particularly during the warning period. And you'll see underlined here, Tylenol for pain, no NSAIDs, and particularly because of the low platelets. All right, chikungunya is, comes from the Makande word for that which bends up, which has to do with how patients hold their hands. Um, so with chikungunya, patients will often develop arthralgias or actually frank arthritis with effusions beginning about two to five days after the fever starts. The arthritis tends to be symmetric and bilateral um, and tends to affect peripheral joints more so than proximal joints, although it can affect any area of the body. And it's really older travelers that are at the highest risk of developing this chronic and very debilitating arthritis that can happen after the fact. Um, and again, NSAIDs are actually the treatment of choice for this arthritis initially, but you have to start with Tylenol until you're sure that the person doesn't have dengue and that they've recovered from the systemic illness. Um, the diagnosis of all three um, infections in the United States is usually confirmed after recovery, and this has to do with some of the limitations of testing. So looking at the um, timing of things, um, actually, I'm just going to put up this graphic. So 
Um, what we see early in all three infections is the viremia happens early. So in the first week, the test that is most likely to pick it up is, um, is actually a PCR. And with dengue, there is a test called the NS1 antigen that is very good at picking up the virus within the first week. Um, the issue with these two tests is that they're both tests that in the United States need to be sent to reference laboratories. So they're good to send so you can confirm your diagnosis, but you won't get them back until the patient's recovered. Um, the dengue serology, so the important thing to be aware of is that the IgM will not even show up until at least the fourth day of illness. And even at day four, which most patients have shown up for care at this point, the IgM sensitivity is only about 50%. So one of the most common things we see are people saying that um, they've ruled out dengue because of serology, but serology that was done too early. So if you suspect it and want to confirm it later, you need to repeat convalescent serology. So in terms of our case, um, this patient actually, although they had swollen hands and feet, this was dengue, not chikungunya, and the person had entered the critical period where they developed um, swelling as a result of third spacing, uh, but they were treated with supportive care, Tylenol, no NSAIDs, and recovered beautifully. Um, I'll say a couple of words about this um, as, a, as a direct request from one of our internists um, who has been starting to get consults about the dengue vaccine. So the dengue tetravalent live vaccine, otherwise known as dengvaxia, is becoming available commercially in 2022. However, um, this is not an adult or pediatric travel vaccine. It is uniquely approved by the FDA for children between the ages of nine to 16 who are living in a dengue endemic area. And the impetus for developing this in the United States or having it commercially released is um, that there are many dengue endemic areas like Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands and American Samoa, for instance, that may benefit from this vaccine. Um, and this is really the most important point is that we, this vaccine can only be given to a person who has an absolutely solid laboratory confirmed evidence of previous dengue infection. Um, and this is because of the phenomenon of anti antibody dependent enhancement where people um, with past dengue are more likely to develop, to develop se severe dengue with their next infection. For people who have never had dengue before, the vaccine can act like the first infection and actually make them more likely to have severe dengue if they go to the tropics and get infected. So that's a big problem. Um, and so people wonder, well, can't I just send dengue serology on my patient to see if they've had dengue? Um, the, re the requirements for this are more stringent. To prove that the person's had dengue, they either need to have had a, a proven positive dengue PCR, a proven positive NS1 antigen, that would have been during an acute infection, or positive results on two different dengue assays of a specific type in a two-step testing algorithm um, that has a high specificity for dengue. Our commercial dengue serology cross-reacts with a lot of other flaviviruses, including West Nile virus, which is endemic in the United States. So the recap for dengue, Zika, and chikungunya, these are short incubation diseases. They all present with fever, headache, rash, arthralgias, myalgias. The IgM misses early infection. Um, and dengue, we want to look for warning signs and start with Tylenol, no NSAIDs for pain and fever. Okay, now I will come to my last travel-related infection. For part three, what else is hiding in the grass? Um, this is a case that I saw um, about three weeks ago of a 28-year-old man who was working on environmental projects in rural Zimbabwe in the early summer. He was walking through the grasslands, he visited archaeological ruins, and then on about the 10th day of his trip, he started feeling feverish, but of course didn't have a thermometer, um, had myalgias and fatigue, and then noticed some new lesions on his legs in the outer thigh and the left groin. And here are some of the representative lesions. So you can see that there's um, a, a red halo. Um, they were at different phases of evolution. So this was more of a papule, it was a little bit raised. And this one, there is a black center known as an eschar. Now, of course, right now uh, we're all taking travel histories because everybody is more concerned about monkeypox. Um, that's not what this is. This is um, a, a classic case of spotted fever group rickettsiosis. Um, I should also mention actually he had bilateral inguinal lymphadenopathy. Um, so this is rickettsia africae. Uh, rickettsial illnesses are intracellular gram negative rods that are actually zoonoses transmitted um, from, um, with, with a cycle between um, giraffes, antelopes, other types of ungulates in sub-Saharan Africa. The vector is a tick. And so this is the amblyoma tick um, that is found throughout Africa, but this one is a particularly aggressive biter. So often patients will have multiple eschars because of having multiple tick bites. And although it's present all throughout Africa, this is really the distribution where we see um, most of the cases coming from in the United States. Um, I should also mention though that this tick 
doesn't attach for as long as Ixodes ticks um, and is very and can be very, very small. So only about 20 to 40% of patients actually report a history of a tick bite. Um, this illness um, is actually a lot more common than people realize. It's actually the most common cause of fever returning from Southern Africa and particular safaris and game parks. Um, right now, in terms of our travel boom, I am seeing a ton of patients that wanna go on safari in Africa. So I think we'll be seeing more of this. Um, in prospective series, um, they've actually measured an incidence at four to 5% of return travelers from the safari game parks. Um, these can be very short trips. And the primary risk factors are hunting, because uh, of course people are sitting in the brush waiting for animals. Um, travel during the summer and going to Southern Africa. Um, so in prospective series, the most common constellation of symptoms are actually nonspecific fever, headaches, and myalgias in particular of the neck muscles. Um, and a lot of patients actually did not have eschars. Um, the percentage ranged from 50% in the prospective series, which I think are more reliable, to in some of the retrospective series, almost all patients having these inoculation eschars. And it was also fairly common for patients to have more than one because of these really aggressive biting patterns of the ticks. Um, and it also presents a lot with regional lymphadenopathy, hence the con potential confusion with monkeypox. Um, so here are some classic examples of the eschar. Um, on, in panel A on the left, this is a classic early inoculation eschar that will usually evolve towards more like panel B. Um, the diagnosis is again um, often made in retrospect because serology takes up to four weeks to convert and sometimes even longer. Um, and we don't, we are, our commercial serology takes advantage of a cross reaction with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, so to get more specific assays, we have to actually go to reference labs. Um, you can biopsy the ESPAR and do PCR and immunohistochemistry, but practically speaking, most of the time the diagnosis is established based on clinical features, epidemiology, and also um, we end up having to treat with doxycycline before knowing about the diagnosis. Um, and fortunately for this one, the treatment is actually easy. Um, it is with doxycycline. Patients tend to improve very, very quickly, typically within 48 hours. Um, duration of treatment is a matter of debate, but um, typically somewhere between seven to 14 days. Um, and this is, this is what the patient's eschar looked like on day three of doxycycline. So the red halo around it was starting to recede and the beginning of the eschar um, was beginning to heal, um, although the full healing can take a couple of weeks. So I will end on two other general things to be aware of. 34-year-old um, man from the Philippines um, presenting with fever, malaise, conjunctivitis, these, this is what coplic spots look like um, and a generalized rash. So namely that we are seeing a lot more measles and are likely to see a lot more measles as a result of um, decreased immunization practices among parents. Um, and be aware that there is a birth cohort in the United States that is under vaccinated who as part of their routine immunization series only received one dose. And the second thing to be aware of that it, there are increasing uh, reports of gram negative resistant infections and colonization in people who are traveling. Um, and this is a study known as the combat study where they showed that in particular from South Asia, um, up to 75% of travelers with, were returning with just on their person colonization with multidrug resistant ESBL gram negative bacteria, and particularly if they took antibiotics abroad. So with that, um, I will mention my last couple slides. My routine workup for the ill-return traveler um, is a general CBC electrolytes urinalysis, and then making sure that anybody that's been to a malaria zone gets their smears, um, remembering that influenza is a year-round illness in parts of the tropics. And then the rest of the workup is really informed by um, the epidemiology and the exposures. And again, don't forget you're an internist. It might not be tropical or infectious, and they might have COVID-19 and something else. So with final thoughts, um, inform your differential based on geography, exposures, and timing. Um, a one negative malaria test um, does not rule it out, and we need to have a very high suspicion for that. Watch for warning signs with dengue and rickettsia. All travelers to the South American game parks need a close skin examination looking for the ESCAR. And the most important thing really is that now that our patients are going abroad again and we have um, American globe trotting, um, we need to all make sure that we're taking our travel histories again. And with that, I'll say thank you. And I think I left a couple minutes on these questions.